Hello and welcome to another episode of the Melbourne Athlete Development Podcast. Today, I have with me Associate Professor Natalie Collins. Natalie, thank you for being with me today. Thank you, Jack. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Now, happy to have you here. So it's always useful to give some context to the conversation. So could you give us a background of who you are, what you've studied, what you've done, and your current position? Certainly. Uh, so I'm a titled sports and exercise physiotherapist. And uh, as you mentioned, I'm an associate professor in physiotherapy at the University of Queensland. My research focus has very much been on preventing the persistence and progression of knee pain across the lifespan and particularly relating to patellofemoral pain conditions. Mm. And that's sort of spanning everywhere from adolescents with patellofemoral pain all the way up to older adults with patellofemoral osteoarthritis. I also I teach across um, all three of our physiotherapy programs at UQ as well. So that includes our Masters of Sports and Musculoskeletal Physio and also our undergraduate and graduate entry master's programs. You know, we'll, we'll briefly talking um, off air before we started that you've actually done quite a bit of research in different areas. And it's actually something that I always really value and appreciate because well, typically I think it gives you obviously more uh, exposure to looking at different things and looking at it from different lenses. Is that something that you cognitively chose or was it really more reflective of the people that you're working at with different time points within your career? Yeah, good question. I think it's it probably comes down to the fact that I, I am interested in lots of different things. But if you have a look at what I've done and what I'm doing currently, it does all kind of still tie into the one theme where, mm. where even from undergrad I was really interested in the lower limb and particularly how it relates to um, overuse or non-traumatic type pain and injury mm. and then the different ways that we might be able to address that whether it's with exercise or um, footwear interventions or or other things like that mm. you know and uh, it's typically an area of interest I have too with related to more overuse or insidious onset of pain because I think a lot of the time particularly for people who enter the physiotherapy profession they think about you know acute injuries and using a series of special tests to get, create a, get a perfect diagnosis but so much of what we see, whether it's, you know, uh, anterior knee pain, low back pain, neck pain, they often fit into this more uh, non-specific nature and often a bit more complex nature. Mm. But, and I know you've actually done some research of looking at telephemoral pain and the, as an indication or risk factor for future knee problems. Can you actually talk about the research you've done in that area and whether there is a relationship between anterior knee pain and future knee issues? Yeah, this is probably um, one of the most interesting parts of my research track, or I think it is. Um, And I guess it goes back to the fact that we used to think that patellofemoral pain was a self-limiting condition, so um, it would just go away on its own uh, over a period of time. But from the work that we've done, as well as work from other groups, we actually know that somewhere around 60% of young adults will still have patellofemoral pain up to eight, 10 years later. Mm. And um, some recent work from Michael Rathliff shows that somewhere around 40% of adolescents will continue to have pain after 10 years. Mm. So patellofemoral pain, we now know is something that often persists across somebody's life. The other thing that then we've been starting to explore is whether patellofemoral pain that affects adolescents and young adults is actually a precursor to patellofemoral osteoarthritis in later life. And this kind of comes from the fact that they share very similar clinical profiles. So the symptoms are quite similar. The different impairments that we see are quite similar. And there's also been some studies, not not wonderful methodology, because this is clearly a very difficult question to answer in a a short period of time unless you're going to follow people over their whole life. But there, there are some studies to suggest that, that people who have um, surgery for patellofemoral specific conditions or PFOA do have a history or are more likely to have had a history of patellofemoral pain in their youth. Mm. And so one study that we did, and this was part of my um, postdoc at Melbourne Uni, is we looked at the prevalence of PFOA in adults um, with patellofemoral pain who were aged 26 to 50. And so they had to have had their pain for at least three months. So we're looking at a group who had what we would consider to be chronic or persistent pain. Mm. 
um, we found that a quarter of those people already had radiographic patellofemoral OA, and that was defined using the Kelgren and Lawrence criteria. But what I think was perhaps more interesting than that is that almost half of them had KL grade one. So they had early radiographic signs of patellofemoral OA. Mm. And why this is important is because KL grade one has been shown to predict worsening of radiographic OA in people who have knee pain. Okay. What, so is, really, what is kale? What is a kale grade one? I actually haven't heard of that before. Oh, so on a scale of there's there's a few different ways we can grade radiographic severity of osteoarthritis. Mm-hmm. Um, the Kelgren and Lawrence score is one way of doing that. Okay. And um, basically, the so kale grade zero is nothing. Kale grade um, one is those early signs of um, so the beginnings of osteophytes in the mm-hmm. joint. Yeah, KL grade okay. two is starting to get more more marked or obvious changes with joint space narrowing and osteophytes. Is there an evidence that a patellofemoral pain is increasing in the general population, or has it been something that's been consistent over time? Oh, that is a great question. I actually don't think we have really mm. good prevalence and incidence studies. Mm. Um, ben Smith did a, a systematic review a little while ago to show how common it is. And it's somewhere around sort of 25 to 35% of the population, depending on whether you're active or inactive or an adolescent or an adult. Mm. But to my knowledge, there's not been anything recent that's been really yeah, okay, really good quality. They're hard to do, those studies. Yeah. And the, the reason why I ask is I, I, I tend to look at problems from an evolutionary perspective. And I think about, say, why is it that we get a, there's a higher propensity towards getting the telephemoral pain compared to other issues within the lower limb. And it, the one thing I think about straight away is some of the changes in, say, health markers within the general population. Like we are a population who are more sedentary, have a high prevalence of being overweight or obese, changes in dietary habits. And I think of then also, too, about some of the um, – I remember reading a study of looking at fatty infiltration within the quadriceps, I think it was vastus medialis and its prevalence to, I think it was more tibiofemoral OA. But then it makes me think about the relationship between, say, a local tissue environment and how that influences the chemical environment and how that may impact the associated joint. And so it just made me think about, is there, a, is there maybe some type of link or correlation? There? And this is just me thinking out loud. I'm not necessarily sure if there is any research to further support that. Yeah, I mean, in patellofemoral pain, no, the short mm. answer yes, that I'm okay. aware of. Um, there's, it's certainly been something that's been in my mind as, a, as an area that we need to look at. Patellofemoral pain is an interesting condition because it's, it's clearly aggravated by activities that load the patellofemoral joint, so um, activities that involve knee flexion in weight-bearing, so things mm. like squatting, jumping, running, um, going up and down stairs. But then there's also this other sort of um, category of aggravating factors around sitting and just maintaining um, a a flexed knee position but not in a weight-bearing state. mm. And so it kind of then tells us that it's a condition that could actually affect anybody in the population from the very sedentary all the way up to the um, highly active. And that kind of then makes it difficult to figure out at a, at a global or a population type level, what are the risk factors for the condition? Mm-hmm. Are they consistent across all of these people or are there different factors that might tap into to different proportions of the population depending on their, um, on their phenotype but also the, the types of activities that they do or don't do? Well, to, to build on that, has anyone or have even yourself thought about different subclassifications for patellofemoral pain? Because... When I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when I think of patellofemoral pain, I think of it as just like a very broad term to describe anterior knee pain. Now, whether that's actually coming from the patellofemoral joint, whether it's actually coming from the surrounding uh, connective tissue structures, whether it's like the capsule, the retinaculum, whether it's maybe even related to some type of myofascial like pain from the, the distal quads, I sort of see it fit into all those potentially fit into it. And even clinically, I think about some different tests that may or may not be positive with patellofemoral pain. Do you look at it the same way? And are there any particular subclassifications you've come across or people have proposed? 
Oh, you've, you've touched on some really key points there. I guess they're <laughs> definitely reinforcing the fact that we don't know the exact mm. structure that causes patellofemoral pain. We have some evidence to show that pain is more likely to come from some structures than others based on um, uh, particularly the the arthros- arthroscopic study of Scott Dye where he actually okay. went in. This is, I think, one of my favourite papers of all time. So right. he um, he and another person had had an arthroscopy done on their knee without anaesthetic to palpate all the structures in the knee to see which <laughs> ones gave the most pain or, um, Interesting. or the greatest severity of pain. Um, yeah, not something that I think you'd get through ethics now. No, or not here anyway. would volunteer for. <laughs> um, but the really interesting thing was that the structures that were most painful on palpation were the fat pad and the synovium. Mm. So the cartilage itself is is not, and we've known for some time that, that there's no neural structures there, mm. that it's not really capable of being a, a source of local nociception. But That's certainly the fat pad and the synovium are. Mm. And then I guess when you start to think about, so one side of it is we don't we don't know exactly where the pain's coming from and why, but mm. the the other side of it then being the subgrouping there have been studies that have tried to do this, and one particularly big study in the UK, um, probably about ten to fifteen years ago now, um, where they they did try and group people based on particular characteristics. the The difficulty in that, I think, is that there are so many different, like I mentioned before, there's so many different things that feed into why someone has patellofemoral pain mm. and why they continue to have patellofemoral pain, but there are common things, but to a degree, people are probably almost their own subgroup. Mm. Because one of the limitations of those of the studies that have been done is that they've really only looked at the physical factors, and we know that patellofemoral pain and many other musculoskeletal conditions are so much more than the physical. We've got the psychological, we've got the social, yes. um, we've got other things we need to think about, and so it's it's almost too too simplistic to just be subgrouping based on a small selection of, of um, physical features, I think. Yeah, and look, I, I feel like that's a bit of a pervasive problem within our profession because we like to focus a lot on the why and go, oh, here's the diagnosis, here's the protocol and the intervention to apply. But we don't. Yeah. it's so much important to think about the what, like what is actually contributing to that. And that's when you sort of open up the whole can of worms because you can consider mo- many things both related to the musculoskeletal system, but also other, um, you know, non-musculoskeletal related factors as well. And I think that also sort of touches into some of the research you've done because you've also, you've looked at like through the kinetic chain, thinking about how things like uh, footwear may have a relationship and also looking at things like um, uh, foot posture and hip EMG, which I guess that's probably missing the knee, but would you be able to talk a bit broadly about some of the research that you've done of looking at the lower limb um, kinetics and kinematics and its relationship to telephemoral pain? Sure. I guess the the where it all kind of came from is during my PhD, I looked at, um, uh, I ran a, a big clinical trial looking at foot orthoses as a treatment for patellofemoral pain. And we found that they are effective. Um, they're as effective as physiotherapy or multimodal physiotherapy. Um, that we looked at at the time and they are more effective in the short term than a flat insole Mm. so there's there's definitely a clinical benefit of foot orthoses in in adults or young adults with patellofemoral pain where i sort of went then with i guess both of my postdocs so the first one was sort of looking at at reasons if can we actually explain what it is about the orthotic that gives it its therapeutic effect. So is it mm. that we are changing biomechanics at the foot, ankle, knee, hip? Mm. Is it that we're changing um, muscle function at the foot, ankle, knee, hip? Mm. Um, what we see particularly from the biomechanical aspect is that the the more consistent changes happen at the foot and ankle, which is not surprising when you've got an intervention that is local to the foot and ankle. But there is a lot of variability between people and the overall sort of average effect is not that big. Mm. And so where it kind of leads to next, I guess, then is thinking, 
are those those little changes in angles that we can actually measure with our standard um, 3D motion capture systems, mm. are they in themselves clinically meaningful? So is this contributing to the, the reason why people have um, an improvement in their pain with foot orthoses? Um, is it that, that that one little angle may not look like much during one session of walking, but over time if you can reduce you know, the amount of pronation or mm-hmm. rear foot um, eversion that someone goes into by that small amount over time, is that actually cumulatively beneficial? Mm. And and that's kind of the issue. We don't really know. A <laughs> lot of those mechanistic studies are only done in the immediate um, session. So we, in the lab, we get someone in, we get them to walk with a shoe, and then we get them to walk with an orthotic and we, we measure the, the immediate effect or the immediate change in their biomechanics with that orthotic. It, I was just going to ask because, like, you talked about uh, changes in the um, angular position of joints. What about with EMG changes? Because I often tend to think of with biomechanics, we can look at it mm-hmm. from the macros perspective. So I, like, I look at someone move and you look at joint positions and angles. But then I also think about the micro perspective in the sense of even if the motion looks similar, are there changes in the neuromuscular patterns that influence, say, the the um well in this case like with the patellofemoral joint the the sliding gliding of the patellofemoral joint at a at a more micro level that may not be evident at a more macro level yeah so we've um we haven't in, in fact we haven't even looked at the EMG data from my post my first postdoc yet uh, okay um which is definitely on the list of things to do mm. um the one of the limitations, I think, in the research that that I've done, but also others have done in, in trying to work out mechanisms of footwear interventions, is that we tend to only look at one aspect at a time. Mm. So we'll just look at EMG. We'll mm. just look at biomechanics. But I don't think we've had a really good way of, of looking at the changes in both together mm. to be able to say, okay, we don't see much in the biomechanical change, but actually look at how much different their motor patterning is mm. or vice versa. And and part of that I think is just our, our access to um, or our, our ability to measure all of these things at once, but also being able to have a sample size big enough that you can that you've got the statistical power to be able to look <laughs> at the relationships. Those studies, those mechanistic studies involve so much time um, mm, in okay. the recruitment, in the data collection, in the analysis and, and processing after, that, that that's kind of why in part we see studies that are reasonably small in size, so anywhere up to about 30 participants. But then when you're starting to marry lots of things together and look for relationships, you may not necessarily be powered to to really be able to conclusively say that's relating to that or that's why that's happening. Yes. The the joys of research, hey? And not yes. enough time or resources to get to answer all the questions you have. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do has it been actually speculation then? Because like you've talked about how um foot or footwear and foot orthoses can be useful. Like what are are there any kind of speculation to what may be going on here that's assisting in improving knee pain? Yeah, the there's kind of if you look at, um, back at the research uh, that Catherine Mills from Macquarie University did as part of her PhD mm. a while ago now, and she kind of proposed these three based on the literature these three paradigms as to how foot orthoses might have their therapeutic effects. So um, it may be that they're changing biomechanics or kinematics. It may be that they're having a shock attenuation effect. So they're dampening that that um, impact or ground reaction force that's coming up from the ground into the leg as you as you hit the ground. Mm. Um, and then they also be, could be having some sort of neuromuscular effect. So actually changing the way that the muscles are functioning um, while you're going through the, act, the particular activities that you're looking at. If we go, if we look at patellofemoral pain, there is certainly um, evidence to show that we can change patellofemoral joint reaction force 
with footwear interventions. And more recently, that's been around the um, the more flat, flexible shoe or minimal shoe. And so that's that's work that came out of Natalie Mazella's PhD down at Deakin and also the work of, of Jason Bonacci. So that's quite an extreme case where you're, you are really fundamentally changing the structure of a shoe, which is going to have mm. implications for the way that somebody walks because now they don't have that mm. big um, that big heel uh, to land on. So we, we know that that will change patellofemoral joint reaction force and we yes. think that that is very key to why people get patellofemoral pain. That's actually an interesting point in itself too, just with footwear and changes in development and footwear, because I feel like there's been many drastic changes in our society in the last 50 years, but certainly footwear is a big one where the selection and design of footwear has a big impact on the actual way that we move and the implications that that has through the kinetic chain. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting to see the, the even in the last 20 years, so we've kind of gone through this period of um, wanting footwear that is supportive and tailored mm. to a pronated foot, inverted commas, yes. um, <laughs> then to a very sort of barefoot, minimal shoe phase. And now I went to buy some running shoes the other day and now we're back in this really chunky phase of footwear again, which mm. I don't think is necessarily supported by the evidence or well, Let's be honest, none of our changes in footwear have been supported by evidence. Hmm. But it's it's just been a really it's been a weird trend to observe mm. that hasn't really been reflected in the literature, I think. I, I wonder actually how much of that has to do with some of these bulky shoes that actually and sometimes often stiffer shoes are popular because it does make you potentially more uh, economical when you run <laughs> and like you know yeah. that as a bit of a, a hack to be like oh look I'm, I'm you know been out I'm out to go, able to go for a 5k run now and take a minute off my time because I think <laughs> there's um there's something nice to that isn't it as opposed to you know wearing your minimalist shoes and struggling and I think that um it actually ties really nicely into Ben O'Neig's theory of of the preferred movement path so mm. that that idea that your everybody's skeleton has a particular path of movement that it likes to follow yes. and a good shoe or a good running shoe gives you the support to do that movement without mm. too much resistance mm. and and as you do that in a, a good running shoe or, or an ideal running shoe for you it actually um demands less muscle activity and less energy and less oxygen consumption. Yes, yes. I think that also really fits in well when I think about biomechanics is uh, I think sometimes you hear this idea that there is a like quote unquote perfect or optimal uh, way to move. But the reality is we see such variability just based on anthropometrics, you know, joint angles, flexibility you name it and so it's more of this like well perhaps we need to think about these bandwidth so if here is your bandwidth how do we actually support you staying within that bandwidth because if you go too far this way you actually are more predisposed to getting some type of overload injury or a stress reaction if you're a runner whatever it may be that's that's so true and i think mm. we've tried to fit people into these boxes of you're an overpronator you're a mm. overpronator um and by some like old school measure, that may be true, but that may actually be perfectly fine for them. Mm. And you see beautiful examples of this at the Olympics where people yes. run with the shittiest mechanics and uh, you're looking at them thinking, oh, are you, like, are you okay? How are your knees going? But they're, they're clearly performing exceptionally well and um, by all accounts with minimal symptoms. And you, you, can, you can see the same thing in weightlifting in the Olympics. So, you know, think about, well, you know, it's a clean and jerk and the a snatch both have squatting movements. And there's this idea that, you know, we have to have knees over toes all the time. But if you watch a lot of the, the world's best lifters, these are the people who are finishing on the podium, particularly a lot of the Chinese lifters, as they're coming up from a, a, a deep squatting position for the, either the, the, after the clean or the snatch, the knees collapse in quite a bit. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? You know, like I, I'm not assuming maybe they are cueing that, 
But I think, well, there must be some reason for that. And for me, it actually kind of makes sense of, of the fact that if you're doing a high velocity movement and you go into some level of valgus, you're creating a lot of tension for that lateral myofascial plane into the iliotibial band and gluteals that probably gives them a mechanical advantage. Now, it yeah. could be said like, well, isn't that problematic for the knees? Maybe that's a, a whole nother point of discussion. But from a performance standpoint, there's clearly a reason why people develop certain movement patterns to optimise their force output. Yeah, and it's I guess it, it's the same when you look at how people respond to not just the demands of what they need to be able to do, whether it's for their sport or their work, but also if they've got a pain condition or they've had an injury. Mm. Our bodies are quite clever at finding a way around that and yes. sometimes that's that's great, that works. Sometimes we may not quite have the capacity in our tissues to deal with that new or optimised movement pattern and we may just need a little bit of help to to support that, whether it is um, building a bit more resilience in our tissues, building mm. more strength in particular muscles to be able to support that. Yeah, it makes you think of a story of when I graduated, I worked with a, a physio who used to be in the AFL this is probably, he must have been in the AFL in like the, the 90s, early 2000s. And they had a player who was an older player, probably in his 30s, who had had a, a career of basically no injuries. He'd been pretty lucky. And they were thinking during the off-season when they were looking at just how he moves that the mechanics of how, he's, how he was running was not optimal. And so they thought, you know what, let's work on him changing these particular biomechanical factors. We might be able to get a little bit more out of his performance in the season. And what happened? After in that season, he got his first hamstring strain. And so it was an example where it's like, I think maybe perhaps also too, where this was an, uh, an older individual who was probably getting towards the end of their career and maybe their adaptive capacity had changed because they had really started to um, refine their movement and their tactics for how they play to get a good outcome. But also too, you know, it's, there's always, also the argument to be made of, you know, if it ain't broke don't fix it you know um and I, I know that can also be sometimes uh, a controversial thing to say because some people might say but you know look at this person's movement patterns like we should change it and it's like well uh, i don't know i'm not necessarily convinced that that's always it's always worth changing just because you can yeah and that i think that goes for people who 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 do and don't have pain and mm, certainly yes, one of the absolutely one of the big trends around patellofemoral pain has been to um, to retrain people's gait, so get them to land, you know, in a more midfoot, um, mm. or, sorry, land less on their heel, more midfoot, yes. um, quicken their cadence, knees more apart. Mm. Um, I'm actually probably a really good example of where that can fall apart mm. because I did that. Um, I have patellofemoral pain as a disclaimer. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and when I was training for a marathon, I went through a process of, of optim optimising, again, that mm. covers um, my gait pattern, which made my knee feel good for mm. a while but actually gave me this awful new hip pain. Yes. Which has always now just made me very cautious of if I'm going to change something, so, yeah, something in the way that somebody moves, I need to be very sure that it is going to do what I want it to. So it's going to improve the movement pattern or function that, that we're trying to target or offload the area that needs some, some work. But it's also not going to flare up any issues in any other parts of their body. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think um, the simple... Remember that when it comes to physics, that you still have a ground reaction force and depending on your, say, foot strike will influence where those forces go, but you could very easily transition from going um, in a hill strike to getting patellofemoral pain to going into a um, forefoot position and getting Achilles tendon pain. So, <laughs> yeah, the forces still have to go somewhere. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you've also done some research of looking at foot posture and hip EMG activity too. Can you talk a little bit about some of the, the research you've done in that and, and the relationship between the foot and the hip? Yeah, so this was um, some work that I did with uh, Associate Professor Adam Semkew when he yeah. was working at UQ. Um, what we wanted to know is whether foot orthoses could immediately change gluteal muscle activity, um, firstly in healthy young adults or young adults without any pain. And we did this using um, fine wire EMG. Mm. So what we found is that the EMG activity of the anterior, middle and posterior portions of glute med and then also the posterior part of glute min um, were reduced 
in the early stages of um, or the early early phase of stance, and they, that was up to about a forty percent reduction in their EMG activity. Mm-hmm. Um, so we thought that this could be clinically useful for people who have hip conditions like gluteal tendinopathy and hip osteoarthritis where we might be able to use photothoses to offload hip muscles that are painful or mm. fatigued in those acute phases of, of pain and injury. I was just actually going to say, because this is always, I feel like when we talk about EMG studies, um, one, I feel like a lot of people perhaps, and this is not you personally, it's probably more clinicians perhaps extrapolate ideas about what EMG findings um, can actually tell us clinically. But the idea that higher EMG is, is better is the other one too, because I think the idea of like, and you know, this is also perhaps a little bit of a, a issue I have where it's like, you've got to get the muscle to activate, activate, activate. And the idea that, you know, more EMG is better, but you know, as you're alluding to here, well, is that always the case? Are you actually overloading a tissue structure because it's taking a lot more biomechanical load than it actually needs to because of inefficient movement? Excellent point. And um, I was listening to your podcast with Manuela Basomi the other oh, yes. day um, where you went into that in quite a lot of detail. Mm. Um, the It is a really good point and I think we need to remember what EMG is, so mm. being a measure of the neural drive to a muscle, not a measure of the output or the force output of a muscle. Yes. Um, and EMG or neural drive to a muscle being only one aspect of the force generating capacity of a muscle yes um but i think if you go back to to that um that preferred movement pathway of ben O'Neill's, we if something is comfortable and someone's operating in their preferred movement pathway then the muscle demands should actually be lower mm. so they shouldn't they shouldn't need to be activating their muscles excessively or to Mm. a higher degree to be able to support that preferred movement pathway and so where I think maybe we interpreted um, a decrease in EMG amplitude to be a negative thing in the past it actually may be a really positive thing well and I, I I find interesting when you look at research that looks at as someone improves um doing a particular physical task you actually see a reduction in EMG because they become more efficient at the movement. And you actually see that too with cueing as well, where, you know, like a lot of people will use internal cues to increase EMG activity because internally cueing of focusing on the muscle does do that. But if you compare that to an external cue, you see less EMG behavior activity but you actually see an increase in force output because external cues tend to actually increase the amount of force produced. And so I think that's something that's important for people to remember clinically that uh, the idea of more is not always necessarily better. But And also, like you just mentioned too, understanding that it is a proxy for force output because there obviously are other considerations to, con- to consider as well. Exactly, yeah. Mm. EMG tells us a lot of really good things, particularly if we're trying to understand the the way that different muscles work together to support mm. a, a particular movement, but it certainly has its limitations that we need to acknowledge. Yeah. So, like, and you briefly mentioned this before, then too, when we think about the development of well, patellofemoral pain, but then by extension, osteoarthritis and the relationship to biomechanics. It, it, do you think it's too much of a reach to suggest that biomechanics is a an important factor, or is it still just really one of those things where? We still need to do a lot more work to be able to to determine the relationship exactly between joint health and mechanics. This is a really good question. Um, the The thing that we know, if we're talking about joint health, what we do know from um, from work done predominantly in in animal studies or animal models is that we actually do need load for joint health. So the cartilage mm. itself needs an optimal amount of joint load to be able to be healthy and able to withstand all of the forces that, that humans want to place on it with all the weird and wonderful things we do. And I think that point needs to be emphasised because I think, you know, um, particularly in the general population, but even potentially for some practitioners, forgetting that low tissue, including cartilage, responds to mechanical load. Yeah, and it's probably why some of our um, some of our patients come to us and say, 
I've done exercise, it hasn't really worked for me. Mm. It's probably because in a lot of cases we underload our patients. Hmm. So even if we're trying to get muscle changes, we're probably not giving people a high enough dose of resistance exercise and particularly people who are older, so Mm. people who have osteoarthritis, to really be able to change their tissues in a way that will have a, um, a, a real impact on the way that they function and the capacity of the muscles to support that function. Mm-hmm. That's actually probably a, a good segue into um, talking about some of your research you've done related to the GLAD program. Because, well, actually, could you even uh, just briefly talk about what the GLAD program is and uh, where where it's originated from? Yeah, sure. So, GLAD stands for um, Good Living with Osteoarthritis uh, in Denmark or from Denmark. Mm. Um, it was a, it's a program that originated um, in Denmark uh, by Eva <laughs> Roos and Soren Sku. And they really saw a gap in the in evidence based high quality management of people with hip and knee osteoarthritis. Mm. And so, based on some on a whole track of, of prior research that had been done, they developed um, a, a package of care that involves a an exercise program, so a structured six week exercise program, along with um, some really good education about what osteoarthritis is, what it means for people living with the disease and how they can really optimise their management of of their condition to be able to live um, well with osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's now, I mean, it's grown hugely clearly in Denmark, but it's Mm. also now been adopted in, I think, more than six or seven countries around the world Um, and probably about, what year are we now? maybe about seven or eight years ago, came to Australia. Mm. And so my involvement has been around, um, so I am involved as a a trainer, so I'm involved in running the training courses for physios and now Mm -hmm. exercise physiologists in Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, But I've also been involved in some research to try and understand how GLAD works in our public health system, um, particularly here in Queensland. Yeah, because this is... um... This is what I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this because um, there's obviously a, a growing there's there's growth in terms of educating people about the Glad program. But I'm interested what's what's the where do you see it fit in with what we do clinically? Because and this is just my personal reflection. I feel like at the moment within physiotherapy, how the sort of current narrative is pushed is we we tend to be much more protocol driven. You know, and like the sort of the comment I made before about here's your diagnosis, therefore we're going to do A, B, C because you've got well, the telephoneal pain is a good example, but we can obviously extend that to things like osteoarthritis. And where something like the GLAD program fits in because it's a, it's a generalised program that I guess is applied to the people with OA, but do we need to then have nuance to how we evolve or adapt or progress that program based on individuals' capacity and response? Yes, and I think this is a really a really important point to highlight. So standardised programs or protocol-type programs, I think, have their place in that it's a way that we can make sure that people with hip or knee OA are actually receiving quality exercise and education treatment that meets a minimum standard. Mm. And that's really where it came from, the fact mm. that there were patients not even, not not being given a a treatment that was sufficient to actually um, address some of those impairments as to why they were getting symptoms associated with their osteoarthritis. Mm. Um, but what we also need to consider is that generic or protocol-based programs are only going to go so far. So we, you might find that a, a protocol-based program gets the majority of people somewhere about 80% better. Mm -hmm. But that's a number I just pulled out of the air. But but it's it's that extra level of tailoring of that program to the individual that's actually going to get them the best benefit. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be thinking about how each individual patient in front of us presents. So not just their physical presentation around their strength, their range of motion, their balance, but also... um, things that we've touched on before around their psychological factors, different social factors, their beliefs and preferences about treatment. I I don't think we 
we really mm. consider enough in mm. in our prescription of treatment for people. And so it's kind of like I see it as, um, and this might be a bit of a <laughs> gross generalisation, but, you know, you, your group programs at the gym. So you go in and you do your Les Mills um, body pump class. Yes. And you can kind of tweak it enough to suit you so you can up down your weights, you can do their level one, their level two exercise, you're still going to get stronger and you, you're still going to get some benefit out of that. Mm-hmm. And a group-based environment can be very motivating and it's a way that you can have something that's easy to roll out across multiple people. Yes. But you're probably going to get a much better outcome if you go to the personal trainer or the exercise physiologist and say, this is me, this is what I want to be able to do, what I need to be able to do in my sport, my job, my personal life. Um can you develop a program for me and take me through that program that is really going to target those things? Mm. And look, uh, and I think what that highlights too is where's the starting point of the individual because actually applying a general program may be appropriate and what are the resources or constraints that you have? Because if it's, you know, one person working with a group of 20, then certainly you're going to have limitations to be able to apply an individualized training program. Yeah. And I think that's where the, the, particularly in public health, Mm -mm. the, the group-based or the protocol-based treatments are a way of getting, um, of helping more people with the limited amount of resources or money that you've got. Mm. And I guess one thing to point out with the GLAD program, and as I mentioned, I'm involved in in teaching um, mm. or yep. training physios and ex physios in this, but it's we we very clearly teach people that that it is a structured program, but we very much expect that. You will tailor the different exercises to the individual patient as you need to within that setting. Mm. You know, I've spent some time going down looking at the research of cartilage response to mechanical loading like we talked about before. And the reality is, particularly when you get older, it seems that the cartilage cartilage's ability to remodel is very limited if it has any capacity at all. At all. And so this always brings up an interesting, um, I guess, dilemma in my head because we talked before about how tissue responds to mechanical loading and ideally you kind of want to progressively overload that. But if we're not actually necessarily seeing change at the level of the cartilage, is some of the mechanisms for the benefit of exercise related to more, say, systemic effects? Or, and obviously there's obviously changes to the, the the muscular system as well. Has there actually been... Has anyone actually looked into exploring this further? Because I think when I think about OA, it's clearly much more of a systemic problem. It's not just, you know, wear and tear of the joint. You actually see a lot of other um, issues with chronic disease associated with it when you think about metabolic syndrome, obesity, and so on. Do you have any thoughts on this in particular? It really, it's, it is such a good point. Um, and I, I think we get stuck on the cartilage as being the issue in osteoarthritis. And what we know now is that osteoarthritis is a disease of the whole joint and most likely mm. broader, um, broader parts of the whole person. Mm. And so as we mentioned before, cartilage is, like you said, loses its, its ability or capacity to regenerate as you get older also doesn't have any nerves in it. So it's Mm, mm. not necessarily the thing that is going to be causing someone pain. Yes. But we do know, and there is an increasing amount of research coming out around the subchondral bone as being important, possibly even in the early phases of osteoarthritis, so before Mm. you start to see the changes in the cartilage, that they may be driven by the changes that are happening in the subchondral bone. And we know that subchondral bone can be a source of pain and quite a marked source of pain. And subchondral bone responds to changes in load um, yes. in timeframes as, as short as six weeks. So there's the local things in the sort of bone <laughs> joint structures themselves that mm. where we might exercise might be having an effect, particularly if you're changing the way that a, a joint is loaded. There's also things like um, the consideration of the effects of exercise on systemic inflammation and how that ties into to how much pain someone perceives. Mm. Um, and particularly if you're looking at structures around the knee that we we know can can cause quite a lot of pain, like your fat pad and mm. your mm. synovium and the the inflammatory 
component of those. Yes. Maybe exercise is having an effect Mm. not just on systemic inflammation but also inflammation that's happening in those localised tissues. To my knowledge, we don't actually know that yet. No, no. Um, I often think about too about are there other things that can help support exercise in in the remodelling of cartilage? And actually the thing I think about is nutritional support. This is sort of like trying to um, extrapolate some of the research that's been done of looking at, say, collagen supplementation on tendon uh, tendon health and tendon symptoms with cartilage of like thinking about cartilage the main scaffold is type 2 collagen and within that you have um, other compounds that then create the the particular properties of hyaline cartilage and whether something like type 2 collagen in addition to exercise could have a benefit now this is all purely speculation i have tried i have looked at the research for this and there is a little bit of research showing College, collagen may help reduce some joint pain. Whether it actually helps support remodeling is another question that, that I don't think has been answered. But you know, do you actually see anyone looking at the addition of nutrition, whether it's collagen or something else, in, in addition to exercise to see if it has a synergistic effect or an amplified effect? Um, not, not necessarily in conjunction with exercise. And this mm. is not an area that I'm really across in the literature at the moment but okay. if you look at the um the some of the older studies around um glucosamine chondroitin supplementation there seemed to be this sort of overall effect of no change or no mm. no um impact on pain yes but within that considering um that when you pull lots of data together and even just lots of data from lots of individual people, some people will have an effect or mm-hmm. have a, a positive impact on their pain and others won't. And so I think the reason why it improves pain could be multiple. It could be that it's yeah. having some some regenerative effect of the cartilage. I'm not convinced that something that you take orally actually gets down to the level of the cartilage but that's just me being a bit sceptical. Well, I think actually, probably I, other things going on. Well, I also wonder then too with the, again, combining them, the two, and also then the timing. And so, like, I don't know if you've ever read any of Keith Barr's work on collagen supplementation with tendon, um, tendon symptoms and remodeling. But some of the work that he's done has suggested that thinking of tendons and we can look at cartilage the same way is like it, it's almost like a sponge where when you apply mechanical load to cartilage, it does cause a fluid to be pushed out. And then when you relax, it will draw fluid from the interstitium into the joint. And so if you time the consumption of collagen or even maybe something like chondroitin um, sulfate or glucosamine, where it increases in the level of the blood so that when you apply the mechanical load to squeeze the sponge out, as it draws in fluid from the interstitium, there may be those building blocks that the chondrocytes can use. Now, now again, this is all just pure speculation at this point, but just thinking about the mechanism of is it actually not so much about whether you take uh, particular nutrients or nutritional supplements, but the timing of it with exercise that leads to a a more significant effect. And, again, these are all just thoughts that I have, um, but something to consider. Yeah, it, it's it's a very good point because I think on its own, and and it goes back to that point I mentioned before, the fact that mechanical loading is so important to the mm. nutrition of the cartilage. For it to be able to regenerate, you you need to be loading it. And, and it has like, such a meta, small metabolic window in terms of when you apply the load, the you see an increase in the anabolic response, but it's very short lived compared to say muscle, which is actually a much larger window in terms of its responsiveness and therefore the timing of you know, say protein supplementation. Yes. And mm. so what I suspect is, so I'm, I'm not aware of anyone who's actually done that study, but also I suspect in the real world for people who are See. taking um, yeah, yeah. collagen or um, glucosamine chondroitin supplementation, it's probably firstly not timed with when they're doing any mm. loading, mm. but I also really doubt that they're doing enough loading to yes. have uh, a positive a positive enough mechanical effect to really get the benefits from having that supplementation there. 
And I mean, you mentioned this before, but I actually think it's a really important point to highlight with the magnitude of mechanical loading because, um, you know, I think we actually underestimate that the amount of mechanical load people can actually tolerate and how that optimizes their response. And in fact, I've, I've previously had on the podcast Matt Bourne, who I don't know if you know, he's done a lot of research in hamstring strain injuries. And we were talking about some of the research that Jack Hickey has done of looking at applying actually much higher loads through the hamstring following a, a soft tissue strain than people expect. Because you kind of think of, oh, no, but it's strained. You, you can't put too much load because it's going to cause the fibers to disrupt further. But his research has actually shown that that's not the case at all. It doesn't have a negative um, or adverse effect at all. And I, I think the same can be applied to the joint tissue and joint health as well yeah that is such a good point and it I I mentioned earlier that I think as physios we've been quite um, reluctant to to really push people with osteoarthritis to load their joints too much but I don't think it only comes from us and in working with people who have not just osteoarthritis but also patellofemoral pain there are definitely psychosocial or psychological elements of their condition around fear of pain, fear of loading, that that you almost have to very gradually build them up to those higher loads mm, mm. to avoid the the I guess sort of reinforcing the pain um the uh, kinesiophobia, fear of movement patterns. And and even just the trust that they have in you as a as a oh, totally. clinician, yeah, because you cannot yeah. underestimate that. You might have the best intentions to you doing the right thing, but if you do it to the wrong person, they yeah, they may very well develop a negative relationship with you. Yeah, and that's where it's really important, particularly for the patellofemoral joint, which is it tends to to be most aggravating somewhere around you know 45 to 90 degrees of flexion mm. and knowing the mechanics because it is it is a really interesting joint in the way that it works mm. but knowing whereabouts in range you can really work someone without aggravating their pain showing them that and saying okay we're going to start here this is a safe movement we we need to load you so that mm. you can really build resilience in your tissues and your muscles and your joint um but we're going to do it in a position that is is unlikely to aggravate your pain. If it does, we can totally modify it if we need to. Mm, but mm. but taking them out of that fear of movement really should be one of our first priori- priorities in in managing these people. Do you, this is actually a, a just a question I thought of now. But do you actually see a role then for things like blood flow restriction training as potentially a, a useful starting point for people who? Do, don't tolerate high mechanical load that mm. may actually provide a, a larger stimulus for maintaining muscle mass or strength with doing a relatively lower load? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I have definitely used it for some people and more sort of high-level elite um, athletes who who actually just need to get back to sport and that mm. was we tried everything else and that was the way to get them back to actually loading their their muscles enough. But obviously we need to be careful with particular populations as around the um, some of the potential. Cardiovascular is also, negative. yes. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. <laughs> negative no. effects of that. But I would certainly explore it. Um, I would also, I'm, I know we've kind of in physio, we're stepping away from the adjunct treatments and the, the hands-on type treatments, but <laughs> I think patella taping patellofemoral taping is really effective mm. um the research supports it clinically um it can change someone's pain very quickly and enable them to do some of those higher loading activities you know it, it's a, a funny it's well, not funny it's a really important point you make because um well in fact i talked a lot of to your colleague bill vincencino about manual therapy and, you know, it's it's a pretty controversial topic. But I think just the simple thing of how it can provide a window for you to change the kind of mechanical load you can apply to an individual with exercise. And mm-hmm. as a, a as an adjunct for that very reason, it's a very, very powerful tool. And I, I, I think just keeping it that simple, it's an underestimated how it can be very valuable in certain clinical situations. Yeah, it's manual therapy certainly came up in in my PhD. So that was Mm. part of the multimodal program that we trialled in people with patellofemoral pain. It definitely works um, Mm. as part of that package. Mm. And we know from a lot of other research that it it can change pain 
yes. or mechanisms, who knows, but mm. but we know that, that it can have quite, um, quite quick and um, useful improvements in someone's pain, like you said, that then might allow them to do some of those functional or strength-based exercises that will help them in the longer term. Yeah. It's actually interesting, and you've mentioned this a couple of times now, about exploring mechanisms because I'm someone who very much likes to work from a first principle standpoint and understand mechanisms but so much research these days is more epidemiological or like a you know looking at applied um, applied research of seeing an outcome and it's actually uh, I, I appreciate because it it's helped me appreciate the fact that doing mechanistic studies is actually quite hard it's quite <laughs> time and resource intensive mm. and the other thing um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier but we like Bodies, humans are not just their bodies, but the whole part of being human is so complex. Yes, there yeah. are so many different things that feed into why someone has pain or injury, why a particular treatment does or doesn't work for them. And so in our mechanistic studies, we get this really tiny snapshot of, okay, is, is this changing when we do this or is mm. this a potential reason why? Mm. But we can't, I don't think we could ever capture all of the different factors that feed into that improvement. Yeah, no, it's a good point. And like the reality is any intervention has multiple mechanisms for its benefit and, and potential harm actually and for that matter too. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. It's always interesting to hear, Natalie, about what our guests do outside of their, their, uh, their work, their professional work. Are there any particular hobbies or things that you're exploring at the moment outside of what you do with your research that are capturing your attention? Oh, this is also a great question. So I um, clearly have a quite intensive job. Um, <laughs> I've also got two very small children and mm. so I don't get a lot of time to do other things, but I do like to prioritise exercise and my youngest is, what, 18 months now, so I'm, I'm oh, now wow. getting back into running again. Um, to be but, fair, I think there's a lot to be said there about the interesting experiences you have in your day-to-day -day experience with having two young children. I mean, I don't have any children <laughs> myself, but I'm sure that gives that certainly changes your perspective on a lot of things and starts to actually make you not be always just thinking about yourself and thinking about, oh, I've got to look after two people who are dependent on me now. Yeah, and it also actually really reinforces how important it is as a parent to have that time to yourself. So mm. whether it is going for a run, going to the gym, um, going even just going for a walk and listening to a podcast. <laughs> the other thing I, I like to do or have started to get back into is um, painting. So I used to, oh, yeah. when I travelled a lot pre-kids, <laughs> pre-COVID, um, Travel photography was my my big kind of creative outlet, but now I'm not going anywhere. Um, I've started to paint again, and it's is that one of your paintings in the background? Yes. Yep. Ah, lovely. Um, it's a work in progress. That's probably <laughs> going for about a year now. But... No, I actually, so I don't know if there's actually in the background here, but no, that uh, the one actually over there my um, girlfriend did, but I also actually like getting out the canvas and a bit of acrylic as well. So I've got a few paintings around the house. I haven't actually done any for ages. Mm. It's, um, I hadn't for, I reckon since probably high school and in the last, uh, yeah, post COVID really been kind of a bit more stuck at home. Mm. Um, I found it to be, I mean, it's, it's, I, I really like color. I like having bright things around me, um, mm. which you might be able to tell from the background. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the process of creating something that doesn't, the beauty of it with paint is you can always fix it like or correct it or paint over it. You, yes. you really, the perfectionism is taken out of it. And in science and in physio, we, we are quite, we have to get things done well and quickly, mm. whereas this has given me this whole other um, hobby, I guess, to where that's, that pressure is gone and it's just a real joy to to do to create. Oh, and, uh, look it, it's funny it's again it's getting a bit philosophical here but <laughs> i feel like nowadays creativity is something that we don't allow to to grow and evolve and i actually see that a lot within our profession where uh, I, I i feel like a lot of people will get shut down very quickly if you come in with something different or innovative or um, a new idea 
And I think part of it also too is because we uh, we don't necessarily nurture creative pursuits. And I, I think you actually even see that with some people I do know who I would say are much more creative and innovative physiotherapists. They often have backgrounds in music, in art, um, in some other type of uh, creative industry. And I think there's something to be said about looking at doing those things outside of just reading papers all the time. And that's not to suggest that you shouldn't read research and try to continue to build up your intellectual knowledge. But there is a real art to a lot of what we do. And I think even actually I see that a lot with manual therapy of the art of touch. And, yeah, I don't know. It's something that I actually think people should nurture more. And it's something that I know I'm probably very guilty of um, not doing enough of, say, doing artwork or reading fiction and things like that to actually develop those other areas of the brain that I do think actually have a lot of relevance to what we do clinically. It's, it's such a good point. And what I think has become quite apparent to me. So when I was kind of deciding my career path, mm. I was really torn between the kind of science medical physio path versus some sort of creative career mm. path. Mm. And I, for a long time, I thought those two things were quite distinct. Yes. But what's become a lot more apparent to me lately is, is there not science? Science is a real, and physiotherapy practice, if, particularly if you're good at it, mm. is a really creative process. Mm. And what we don't necessarily get enough time for in, in the work that I do is the time to just sit and think and, mm. Mm. and let those let those ideas kind of come because I think when you're when you're in the process of, you know, writing a grant, writing papers, doing this, collecting data, teaching students, the the ideas don't come. It's when you kind of step back. It's like when you're on holidays or mm -hmm. got a day off and you go and go for a walk and you're like, oh, that's when all the the really yeah. cool stuff comes out. The new ideas. Yes. Where that's a really good approach to that problem. There's a, a book I read. I can't think of the author's name. I think it's a, a, a Korean guy. It's a book called Rest. And it taught, and he documents looking at you know, geniuses within, within modern history, people like um, Charles Darwin as an example, where if you look at his daily habit, he used to get up at like 5 a.m. in the morning. He'd work for three or four hours, and then he'd go on like a two or three-hour walk. And he often documented about he used that time to allow his mind to wander. And through that process, he would literally have epiphanies of going, that is the connection. And then that would then influence what work he would do. And, you know, that didn't necessarily happen every day. It might happen once a month if he's walking every day. But to actually give yourself that time and space away from your work to have a new idea or create a connection in different knowledge that wasn't there beforehand. We don't we don't have that in our daily life anymore because mm. we're so. I mean, you just have to go outside and walk around, and people mm. are always looking at their phone. <laughs> yes, we, we don't have the the space or the downtime to let all of the ideas connect so much anymore. And when you're working in um, in research or in clinical practice, you actually you, you need that. Like that's how ah. the like you said before. That's how the big breakthroughs happen. I, look, I, I mean, like I said, I don't have kids, but I recently got a dog, and so I'm be spending a lot more time outside. He's a he's a border collie, so he's very much an outdoor <laughs> dog, and it's it's something that it's great because you know at first it's like oh I, that's more responsibility all this stuff, but the time I've spent outside and actually going out and exploring has just makes me realize oh wow I actually have neglected that and has implications for how I feel generally, but also within my clinical practice too. Yeah, it's um. It's good also, I think, as a clinician to be able to model that behaviour. Mm. So actually like acknowledging that it is really hard to fit exercise and outdoor time into a busy schedule. But, Absolutely. but the benefits that you get from your physical well-being, your mental well-being, but also your creative well-being mm. I think is, is really important. Are you active online, Natalie? Do you, do you keep up to date? Um, things that you're doing within your research on social media, if people want to follow or keep up to date with what you're doing? Um, yeah, look, probably not as much as I should. Um, <laughs> I do still have a, am I allowed to say Twitter? I don't like calling it the new name. Um, <laughs> Twitter, uh, X formerly known as Twitter. I don't really mind what you call it. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a Twitter account and yes. um, and tend to repost things or um, post mm. when we've got new papers coming out. So that's probably the, the best place to find me at the moment. Yeah. 
look, Natalie, thank you very much for coming on. I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation and, um, yeah, t- certainly taken some good things away from this. I'm sure our listeners will too. Oh, thank you so much. It's, it's yeah. been a pleasure. I really, really enjoyed talking to you as well. Yeah. And, again, just to our listeners, whether you're listening to us YouTube or some other plat- uh, so, uh, podcast platform, I should say, please do like, subscribe, do comment. It does really help us to help uh, expand our reach and share the message. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you.